WNST, Towson, Baltimore, and Baltimore Positive. We are uh, into our wise conversations around here, and this is going to be one of the good weeks for all who believe in the high holy holidays of Augusta. Uh, things are happening around here. When I get offered great golf insiders and analysts, people that write books about Phil Mickelson and Tiger Woods, I have to bring my chemo sobbing and one time high school guides counselor, Dundalk High School Lynn. Uh, I'm surprised you're not on the links right now, Don Moeller. Uh, you, you, it is the season, right? First 72 degree day, you're out there hitting it. I, I, I do like to go out and hit it. And uh, I do have a, I do have a rule. I'm, I'm, I'm not one of the crazy people with the wool hats and the, the mittens. I do like it to at least be above 50, but yes. 50. Oh, all right. 50. Oh, yeah, I'm not a guy who tees it up when it's in the 40s. I, I don't go outside unless it's 64. I'm Venezuelan. You know that, right? <laughs> uh, I tell you but what, we're, we, we, we had out of season masters, right? We, 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 the, the azaleas were weird and fall and all of this stuff. Bob Herrick is here. He has been covering golf a long, long time on the uh, on the ESPN side and the SI side. And has inked a book on Tiger and Phil, and it is a pleasure to have you on. I'm going to have you guys talk amongst yourselves about you know all <laughs> the holes and azaleas and all that stuff. But it's great, and it is golf season. I mean, and golf people, this is it. This is the week, right? No question. Yeah, it's sort of the uh, it's the signal that spring is here, or at least it's supposed to be here when the Masters comes around. Everybody's sort of, man, now I can finally go out and play golf. And uh, it's, it's that time. So, and, it, and it's a long time between majors. So it's, uh, you know, we wait a long time for the next really, really big one. So it's, it's nice that it's finally almost here. Now, I've turned down the Masters a couple of times. I've had chances to go back when I was syndicated, working, and as just a guest. Don shakes his head at me. He's disgusted. I've had people go down there and kiss the ground on Tuesday to see practices and all that. The only question I have, I'm being honest, because I've seen it in HD and all that. Are the birds real or are they just feeding that in when I hear the birds? Yeah, you know, it's a great question that comes up every now and then because it just <laughs> seems like it's so it's it just it can't always be that perfect, right? It feels like Disney World when you're watching. You know, like yes, yeah, it's sort of like that's like come on, it's on cue they start doing that. So <laughs> um yeah, they listen, they they've got the power to do just about anything, but I don't think they can control the weather and the birds, so maybe sometimes they do have to pipe that in. Bob, it it it, it defies my <laughs> imagination that Nestor would turn down an opportunity mm -hmm. to visit Augusta. I, you've been there obviously many, many yeah. times. And what I say to folks, and maybe you can talk about this and we've talked with some others. I think we talked with John Feinstein about this is what the first I've been, I've been fortunate enough. I think I've been there now three times. And <clears throat> the, the first time, I'm driving and I've, you know, I've got the Google maps working and everything. And I'm going to this hall, you know, this place, the Holy grail of golf. And I'm looking around and I'm thinking, wait a minute, I'm on Pulaski highway or route 40 in, in, in Baltimore, in Baltimore County. I, I must have made a wrong turn and sure enough behind these strip centers and this highway, is this mecca of golf? I mean, am I overstating that or is that your experience when you saw it for the first time? No, I mean, it's very pedestrian. If you didn't know what was there, you wouldn't know it was there. I mean, you're just sort of Washington Road is a, right. you know, a conglomeration of, of uh, you know, fast food restaurants, grocery stores, funeral you know, homes. Yeah, malls, whatever. And, <laughs> and all of a sudden, and, and, you know, really, you cannot see in. You can drive past Magnolia Lane, and when it's open, you can look down Magnolia Lane, and you will see the clubhouse down that. But that's the only glimpse that you'll get. And the only reason that you know that it's then there is because they've built things across the street. There's this huge media complex that they've built for the TV production stuff that's across the street. You can't miss that. It looks like it's been there forever. It's very you know state-of-the-art. Um, but you wouldn't know that there's basically a museum back there, a golf museum of history behind uh, off of Washington Road there. And look, if they have their way, and I think they're trying to get their way, they've bought up a ton of property along Washington Road. I think maybe not in our lifetime, there'll be a time where there will be an exit off of I-20 and it'll take you right to Augusta and you won't see any of that. 
it'll be parkland, it'll be nice, it'll be, you know, just how they want it to look, structures that they build. And you'll, and the only time you'll see that is when you venture out yourself. So they've, they've bought up a lot of that as it is. And, and I wouldn't be surprised if maybe someday it's, it's even, it's even nicer. See, I'm going to break this to Don. My, my mom was from Abbeville, South Carolina, and her brother, most of my childhood, lived in Evans and Martinez, which are the mm -hmm. adja adjacent towns. Not Martinez, not, not Martinez, Martinez. It's spelled the same way. That's the southern. But I, I spent time in Augusta as a child in the 70s and the 80s and driving past there and seeing the, the gates. and like. But I haven't been there in forever. And um, for, for, for the last 25 years, right, Tiger, Phil, Phil, Tiger, um, you're not the only one with the Phil and Tiger thing going on. We have Feinstein around here from time to time, but you've tackled this topic and you've been on this from the beginning. Why here and now for the book? Yeah, well, the 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 genesis of the idea was was around after Tiger won the Masters in 2019, and I just thought there was something to capture about him, sort of maybe just that part of it. And then I got to thinking, well, you know, nobody's ever really dove into the rivalry there's been a lot of people wrote books about tiger and so i kind of thought well that maybe isn't going to work but what about phil well what about tiger and phil and then you start thinking well you know we're kind of captured by rivalries in sports you know bird magic and you know yankees red Sox, or you know cowboys eagles no 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 raven steelers just leave it there. Raven, exactly That's, there you go okay, there you indiana go. purdue i'm an indiana grad you know indiana, whatever they whatever are. you say don't say duke carolina to the other guy right now he doesn't he's <laughs> still right. got bad vibes about the acc you know i should have come up with that one immediately actually given what's <laughs> going on but but you know is tiger and phil a rivalry i mean you know, Tiger's got the better record, but I mean, you know, the, the Packers have a way better record than the bears in that rivalry, but they're still rivals. They still don't like each other. And for the mo for the majority of their careers, Tiger and Phil didn't really like each other. There was a lot of friction between them. They, they saw the other guys in their way. And, 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 and in sort of diving into the idea, I found, you know, their, their careers really intersected quite often. Um, and going all the way back, you know, Phil was Tiger before Tiger. Phil was an incredible junior player. He won everything in San Diego as a kid. Moved up, you know, he was winning in junior golf. He won in college. Well, he, he was expected in, to be the best player in the world until Tiger showed up, right? Literally. No question. He had just as much, maybe not as much hype as Tiger coming out, but a lot of hype. Ty Phil was going to be a star, and he is. He became a star. And Tiger, obviously, I think surpassed what anybody thought would happen. And that doesn't always happen. I mean, there's a lot of superstars in college that don't pan out. And these guys did way beyond that. Uh, Bob, it would be impossible. I mean, what a, what a timely, you talk about a timely book, Tiger and Phil, Bob Herring. We've got two narratives taking place now that if they stood on their own, they would be major sports stories, but they're, they're sort of colliding in the sense mm -hmm. that We've got this, if Tiger tees it up in a week or so, just hitting a ball off the first tee after almost having your leg amputated will be <laughs> one of the major sports stories of all time. And we've got Phil, who's not going to play for a variety of reasons, not the least of which is that he's decided to make everyone on the PGA Tour furious <laughs> and talk about playing in Saudi Arabia. I mean, pack, unpack those two. I mean, I'm sure as an ESPN guy, you're thinking of that narrative. Unpack those two stories for our listeners. Yeah, you know, um, on February 1st, I would have said, and nobody would have thought I was crazy, that Phil will be playing the Masters with a chance to win it. Because if he could win the PGA last year, why can't he win the Masters? It's, sure. one of the it's one of the places he can still win. And that Tiger won't be anywhere near it except for the Champions Dinner. And now those things are reversed. Phil's not going to be there. Tiger might be. And um, it's stunning. And it's really stunning what's happened to Phil and how quickly it happened to Phil. Um, to your point about you know his flirtations with this rival golf league that's funded by the Saudi wealth fund, which is worth so much money. They can throw a lot of money at this and take their time if they want to. And, you know, Phil's comments uh, rub people the wrong way. I mean, it, it was clear that 
he was he was very um, harsh on the PGA Tour. Uh, that's where he's made his living for 30 years. That is where his brand was built. Uh, that is where his legacy was built. 45 tour wins on the PGA Tour. That's why he's famous. Not because he just was a great golfer, but he had a record to put up against others. And the way he criticized them really sort of, uh, you know, has, has, you know, it's rubbed people the wrong way. And, and the thing is, is Phil actually had some legitimate gripes, but they got lost in the tone and in some of the things that he said that were off base. And then when you come to find out that he was talking with this rival league and maybe trying to use it as leverage and like, he's 51 years old. Why does he need to do this? He should and he's be a billionaire, li- like literally, he, right? Well, I mean, he should be, I don't know that he is. I, I'm sure he's quite comfortable. Um, you know, people have wondered, does he have money problems? Why would you be chasing it like this? First of all, he was going to be making plenty of money. Uh, you know, he was making 30, $40 million in endorsements, even at 50. And he wins the PGA championship, becomes the oldest major champion ever, a record that had stood for 53 years. The oldest before that was Julius Boros in 1968 when he was 48. Phil tops that by two plus years. His, all of his endorsement contracts are going to be enhanced. If he wanted to do TV, he could have done it. They'd have paid him six, eight, 10 million a year to be an analyst if he wanted. He could go out on the Champions Tour, play six, eight, 10 times a year and clean up. He'd still have a place on the PGA Tour. He could do outings. There's plenty of opportunities for him to make money. So why he went down this road is really strange because, yes, they were talking about huge money to sign on. But at what cost? And look at what's happened now. You know, he's, he's kind of out of the game. We don't really know what's going on. Is it more personal problems? Did they suspend him? They won't tell us. Um, it's, you know, and I find it sad because I think Phil's great. He's been great for the game. Obviously, I, you know, I think he's a top 10 player all time. Uh, he, he, he made it tough on Tiger there in the 2000s after a slow start against him. And, uh, you know, and here he is on the sideline at a time when he should be gearing up for um, the year's first major. Bob, I want to, and this, this may get, we're going to ask you about both Tiger and Phil. Let's start with Phil, since we're talking about Phil and the Phil that you, you knew in your book. I, for, for a number of reasons, I, I've, I've known some folks pretty high up in the PGA Tour uh, during my lifetime and for the past 30 or 40 years, certainly. And I also, like many golf fans, was a fan of Phil. And whenever I, this is early on, this isn't something new. Early on, when I would say that to the folks that I knew at the tour, they would roll their eyes. They would roll <laughs> their eyes, right? It was almost, I almost felt like I was, um, you, you know, watching, uh, you know, a movie, uh, you know, with Don Johnson and, and the two personalities, and they would simply say, you don't get it. You don't get it. So my tour friends are not surprised mm-hmm. that Phil has screwed this up. I wonder if you can, cause you've been around the game a long time. Talk about whether what I was sensing is accurate and then talk about the Phil that you describe in the book. Well, it's also an individual game, right? So there, there is a greed and a, it's all mine built into the game. It's either mine or it's yours, right? Literally it's, it's winner take all. Right. I mean, there is some truth to what you're saying there, Don. I mean, Phil has always, you know, there, there's been some times that have been eye rolling to people, you know, and you've heard these phrases about Phil, you know, uh, smartest guy in the world or smartest guy in the room. Uh, what will Phil do next? Uh, you know, he, he's, he's had this reputation as being a guy who's got a lot of opinions and has got a lot of confidence, a lot of swagger, and he doesn't really mind if people think differently of him. And I think behind the scenes, he probably rubbed some people the wrong way. He probably said some things that were off base. Um, you know, my take of him in the book is more on the competitive side. Uh, I try to point out how good he was, how good he became, how much he appreciated Tiger. The the friction between them was more one-sided. 
Uh, it was more Tiger towards Phil. Phil was always deferential to Tiger for the most part, um, praised him for what he brought to the game, uh, talked about how he made him better, wondered, though, how he might have done if there had been no Tiger. You know, and, uh, uh, and so, you know, in terms of a record, I think the book is very positive towards Phil. There's some little tidbit stories about their interactions, the behind the scenes dissing of one another or that sort of thing that are fairly benign in the overall scheme of things like what we're talking about now. They're more funny than anything. There's some good gambling stories about Phil. Phil loved the action in practice rounds. He had, you know, he had loved to, loved to get under guys' skin. He liked to needle them. He liked to tweak them. He liked to have something on the line. I have a bunch of stories like that. Some of them were involving a good bit of money too, you know, and, um, does that rub guys the wrong way? Or are they all into that? Well, I mean, I think the ones who like to do the same thing, were fine with it. You know, you're I don't not think talking, they... uh, be clear for folks. I've, I've read a little bit about, we're not talking about a five or $10 Nassau. Here. No, no, <laughs> no. I have, there's a story in there where it years ago, he, him and him and John Houston, who's, um, Who's, who won seven or eight times on tour, really good player, made a lot of birdies. They, they teamed up for a while on Tuesdays and sort of took on all comers. And there was one year at the Masters where they, they, they were playing John Daly, and John Daly was able to pick who he wanted to bring. And the first day it was like they, they had sort of cleaned up early. They were playing some sort of best ball game. And Daly says on the 18th tee, he's playing with Tim Heron. And he's agreed to cover Tim Heron's losses. And he says on the 18th tee, how about, how about double or nothing on 18? And Phil and John used to say, no problem, no problem. And I think they were up $3,000. Okay, yeah. not, the, not a huge amount to them, but still, you know, nobody yeah. wants to reach in for three grand. And they, and I might want to make that putt. <laughs> the, rules, the rules were you have to pay off that day and you had to pay in cash. So, you know, anyway, he... Uh, they, they get out there and they're playing 18 best ball. John Daly hits one stiff on 18. He hits one to a couple of feet. He's going to make birdie. He thinks he's going to birdie the hole. They're going to win their money back. It's going to be zero. Now John Houston fills out of the hole. Tim Heron's out of the hole. John Houston hits, hits it on the bank on the green, spins it back. It goes into the hole for an Eagle and they win. So it goes from thinking you're zero now to 6,000. And the next day, Daly brought David Duvall out, who was top player in the world. Phil, Phil and John Houston cleaned up again. Phil made, um, he made eagles on both par fives on the back. And John Houston birdied all the other holes. They played a best ball 25. Wow. And the great, the great kicker to this story is, and I, I've got it all in there, but they owed them like sixteen or $17,000. And John Daly came back. He went out to get it. He comes down in a Cadillac courtesy car down Magnolia Lane, back then the driving range right next to Magnolia Lane. He gets out of the car. He's got a garbage bag full of cash and he walks it out to fill on the range and hands it over and obviously annoyed as hell. He must have had to go to the bank to get it. So anyway, I'd like that in ones, please. (laughs) <laughs> Bob Herrig is here from Sports Illustrated. He writes about golf. You can follow him at Bob Herrig. It's H A R I G. And we're going to be talking a lot of golf around here with the uh, Baltimore Classic Five folks, uh, as well as we get ready for, uh, for for Masters around here. The book is Tiger and Phil about their rivals. So we talked a lot of Phil. What about Tiger? I mean, last I checked, he was, you know, the car out in California and the mess. And um, I don't follow Tiger all that much. I've had a. Um, a dislike dislike relationship with tiger since I met him 25 years ago. So I've always rooted against him, uh, which (laughs) I guess made me a Phil fan without really being one. Um, And now tiger, you know, after the wife comes with the golf clubs and all of this awfulness happens and his 19 and the comeback and uh, the, 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 the surgery, all that stuff. Now he has become this incredibly sympathetic figure, right? Like he has become, Everybody's cheering for Tiger, sort of. Kind Charlie's of, right? dead. He's become Charlie's dead. He, okay. Uh, he's he's become beloved almost, which was probably something we never would have said. You know, it's it's almost he's come all the way around. I mean, he was the the fierce competitor, the the guy who kept everybody at arm's length. You know, never showed much emotion outside of on the course. Wasn't very engaging with fans or even other players. 
And now he's sort of turned into this beloved, almost older statesman, which is really what Phil should be. And, and, you know, I think everybody likes a good comeback story. Um, the comeback from the scandal never resulted in a major. And then he had to take another deep turn with the horrific back issues that he was dealing with. And look, he had a, he had a, he had a substance issue that he had to deal with in the, in the aftermath of the back problem. There was a DUI, which was probably his lowest point. You know, a month after the back surgery, we saw, saw the video of him, you know, uh, being arrested for being on the side of the road where he fell asleep in his car. He's lucky he didn't hurt himself or somebody else. And he had a, so he had a long road back from all of that. And then he ends up winning the masters two years later. I mean, it was, it was one of the great redemption, redemption stories ever. And actually, you know, won again after that and president's cup and all that. And then, and then the back problems set in again, he, we don't know what was going to happen last year before the car crash. He was not doing well. His back was bothering him again. And then the car crash, of course, makes it all a moot point because it's so much more serious um, you know, he could have died in that he was in the hospital for a few weeks. He was on in basically in bed after at home for a couple of months. He couldn't walk for months, probably till April or May, certainly not without aid. And then, you know, here he is, you know, now we're what's actually- interesting, Bob, is he just kind of gone off the radar for a guy like me. That's not in the golf world. Like the accident happened, awful thing. He has not been a f- top of full front page until it's masters. So people are saying, where's tiger. Right. So wh- where is he? Right. What, what, what has transpired here over the last seven or eight months? Cause I haven't well, read a word really, really to your, to your point, he was completely off the grid. He, he made very few, any kind of declarations about his health. He posted a photo or two. There was some video that was seen of him watching his son in a junior tournament, like last summer, but there was nothing official that came out. And finally he, emerged at his tournament in the Bahamas, a tournament that his foundation runs. It's the first time he did any interviews. It was in early December. And that's when, you know, he was there, he was hitting balls. He wasn't playing in the tournament. And he explained to everybody how dire the situation was, how long of a road he had back. He was very somber. I'm never going to play full time again. I won't be able to, you know, maybe I can play a few events a year. My plan is to try to. And then a few weeks later, he played with his son in an exhibition called the PNC Championship, which was televised, 36-hole exhibition, but he rode a golf cart. And they actually finished second to John Daly and his son. Uh, But Tiger looked amazingly good from the golf standpoint, but we knew that he, he, uh, you know, he, he, he playing golf in a cart is a lot different than walking 72 holes without a cart. And it seemed like a long stretch from there to here. The Masters seemed like it would be way too soon. Um, and even, even so, there's any kind of golf will be sporadic because he's going to need time to recover. When he, when he does play a tournament, he's going to need the next week to just probably you know, rehab from that. And, and it's going to be sore. He's got, he had multiple issues with his ankle and his foot, broken bones in his foot. I believe the leg, he had, he had, a, he had a double fracture in his leg, but that's healed. Uh, But the rest of it is, you know, like a rehab issue and walking and it might there might be arthritis. Look, a lot of these things we don't know. They haven't disclosed them. No doctor can talk about it. And Tiger's been very vague in what he said about about these injuries, only (laughs) only that he feels lucky he didn't lose his leg. So um, it's uh, uh, and and, and that's where we are. And and it's all it's all come together lately here very fast because. So seriously, two or three weeks ago, nobody really envisioned that there was any chance that he might play the Masters. Bob, I, I will still be stu- – I mean, I'll be glued. Listen, Nestor laughs at me, and he's right the way I view the Masters. It's one of those things that, you know, shortly after the new year, I jump on – I probably jump on your site at ESPN and find out when the Masters is, the actual dates, and on my calendar – on my, I put Masters Sunday, and my wife knows that means we aren't scheduling any things, any things that are going to take me away from the TV on Masters <laughs> Sunday because that final nine holes to me traditionally can be some of the most electric moments in golf. But what I do want to get back to who Tiger is, but before we do that, 
And, and again, you're perfect to talk about this. What I say to folks all of the time who have not been to Augusta is as beautiful as it is on TV and the fact that they have the little green wrappers, wrappers on the sandwiches, on the pimento and cheese sandwiches. So if they blow away, you can't see them. So they blend into the, to the grass and we pay $1.50 for the pimento sandwich to this day. But what you can't picture is the terrain of that course. This isn't like me grabbing my clubs and walking out here to a muni somewhere in Baltimore County or Baltimore City that's fairly flat. I, I am tired after spending the day at Augusta, and I'm not carrying my clubs and hitting the ball. I mean, tell, describe that. To, I, mean, I can't imagine a guy being through what he's do, being able to do this for 72 holes. Describe the terrain at Augusta for folks who haven't been there. No doubt. It's a very strenuous walk. It's part of the challenge of competing there. You're going to get tired. The legs matter in the golf swing. And towards the end of the round, if your legs are given out, you're not going to swing as well. It's all part. And it's, and the rounds are long. It's it, the course is challenging. The greens, there's a guys take a lot of time. It usually takes five and a half hours. So you're out there on your feet for a long time. So then, I mean, I'll just, I can rattle through it. The first hole, very much uphill. Second hole is downhill. For a guy with a bad foot, walking downhill isn't any better than uphill. Right. That's going to hurt, too. That's going to be tough. There's a, there's a big hill on the fourth to get to the fourth green. The fifth hole is uphill to the tee. Sixth hole is downhill. N uh, ninth hole, eighth hole, very much uphill. Long par five. Ninth hole, uphill to the green. Ten and 11 are very much downhill. Uh, uh, not so much the rest of the holes on the back nine until you get to 18. It's a big, big hill that you go up. It's very hard for TV to capture that. So look, a golf course is four and a half, five mile walk. If it's flat, throw in the terrain, uh, throw in the stress of the tournament and standing on your feet for five plus hours, they warm up before there's not very many chances to sit down. You know, he needs to take the weight off. That's the beauty of the carts. You know, you can just go sit in the carts. It's not even just the drive from ball to from the fairway to the green. It's being able to sit, take the stress off your back. You get off your feet for a few minutes. Obviously, you can't do that at the Masters. And so that's why this is such a, a hard ask, I think. I mean, it'll be a hard ask anywhere. I, if, if he, if he makes, more so here. Forget winning. If he makes the cut, it will be one of the greatest accomplishments in sport. The only thing that I can compare it to in golf, Bob, is I'm thinking back as a little kid, uh, you know, you know, 1964 when Ken Venturi was sick and dehydrated, and the doctors told him at Congressional, "You you can't play the final round. You're likely to have heat stroke." I've still got this image of Venturi basically just slogging to the finish line to win the U.S. Open. I mean, I, I get a sense that's what we're going to do. Real quick, before we let you out of here, who is Tiger Woods? Tell us who he is real quick yeah that's tough i mean i'm not sure i can do it real quick he's a complex guy who who had you know the unlikeliest of upbringings i mean he's he's been famous since he was a kid and as much as his parents tried to keep it normal for him how could it be normal you know when he got to high school he was very well known he tried to live a normal life but the the farther it got the harder it got and you know he's just what we were talking about. We haven't heard from him in months. I mean, what does he do? Like, where does he go? Does he, every time he goes out, he has to be, you know, obviously concerned that people are going to recognize him. And, and I don't think he's afraid to go out, but it's got to be a challenge everywhere he goes. And um, I think it took him a long time to grow up. I think because he was an only child and because of the, the sort of the pampering that went along with every step of his career, it took him a while when, when he was 25, he was probably acting more like a college kid. You know, when he was 30, he probably wasn't acting like somebody who's 30. He wasn't that worldly, you know, and, and it's taken a while. And when he had kids and obviously he went through all the trauma in his personal life, I think he finally started to get the perspective. Now you see a more mature, uh, a guy who gets it a lot more in terms of his family and what that means. A lot of this is for them. Um, but, uh, but I say all that and we still really don't know. We don't know all that much because he's such a complex guy.
The book is golf's most fascinating arrival. We got the book, Bob. Hold it up. Show everybody the book, Tiger and yes. Phil. Uh, Bob Herrick's here from uh, Sports yeah. Illustrated, uh, formerly of ESPN, and uh, you can buy the book and uh, and read <laughs> on. Hey, uh, I hope you have. A, you got any insights on the actual tournament? Uh, who's who you who like? Wins? Who wins? Right. I'm going with Justin Thomas. So have me back on if he wins. <laughs> if he doesn't win, uh, you never we'll said forget, that. We'll forget all about it. Golf <laughs> is the hardest sport to handicap, by the way. Makes no sense. I mean, who would have picked Hideki Matsuyama last year? Great player, by the way. Nobody was talking about him going in. Nobody. So, you know, when people say, oh, they know how, you just, you just don't. It's so hard to predict. And there's a lot of great players that can get it done. Hey, really appreciate the visit. I appreciate you making time, Don. Appreciate you coming in and bringing your golf wisdom. Bob Herrick, the book is Golf's Most Fascinating Rivalry, Tiger and Phil. You can find it anywhere quality books are sold. You can also follow Bob uh, out on Twitter under his name, Bob Herrick. Uh, on behalf of former Baltimore County Executive Don Moeller, we have these wise conversations around here. We bring the Maryland Crab Cake Tour to you. We're going to be at GNA Coney Island Hot Dog on the 22nd. We're going to be at Greenmount Station on the 15th. It's also brought to you by our friends at Goodwill Industries. We're moving around, doing all sorts of stuff for a master's week i am nestor we are wnst am 1570 towson baltimore we never stop talking baltimore positive